forest fires in California, deforestation in Brazil, wetlands drainage in the prairies. Meeting our growing need for food and shelter has disrupted the role plants play in helping to regulate levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But forest restoration, fire management, and sustainable agriculture are helping to put terrestrial plants back into the carbon management business and reduce the threat of climate change. These actions are all part of what scientists call terrestrial sequestration. Funding provided by the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Energy Technology Laboratory. Terrestrial sequestration is actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that has already ended up in the atmosphere as opposed to direct sequestration uh, where you're capturing the CO2 before it enters the atmosphere. You're talking basic photosynthesis, it's something the plants have been doing forever. They're doing it naturally, they're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that may have come from an automobile, some other place of the world, or some industry in some other place in the world. They are fixing that carbon into their organic matter It's being transferred in the roots, and that's how the storage is going. So it is a natural process. In other parts of the world where forests are important, the carbon principally is stored in the wood, in the above ground biomass of the trees itself. For millions of years, plants have played an important role in the cycle that regulates atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas. Our carbon footprint has grown along with the transportation, communication, and conveniences that define our modern world, raising the threat of climate change. Now, people in North and South America and in other parts of the world are applying different methods of terrestrial CO2 sequestration to help reduce our carbon footprint. The rapidly growing plants of the tropical rainforest are very efficient at removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in their trunks and roots. But much of this living carbon reservoir has been destroyed by the clearing of forests to plant grazing grasses and crops. About five years ago, the opportunity came up through this idea of carbon sequestration to bring international funding down to protect significant areas of forest, but also to restore the patches between them that had been converted into buffalo ranches. We began working with American corporations that were interested at that time in experimenting with carbon sequestration as one means to offset their carbon emissions. There's certain criteria that an area or a site has to have to have potential as a carbon project. There has to be a threat of deforestation. There have to be large areas already deforested if you want to build a restoration component in, as we did. You're looking for areas that there's not so much pressure on the area that whatever you reforest will be uh, chopped down again 10, 15, 20 years out. The other thing you're looking for is a type of forest that grows back quickly and captures a lot of carbon. The Atlantic Forest in Brazil is about the equivalent of an area from Newfoundland to Florida. It is among the most biodiverse forests in the world. So this is an area that's been under a lot of pressure. However, a lot of that pressure has come just in the last 50 to 60 years. A lot of the impacts have come from industrial clearing of land, large-scale forestry operations that have cleaned out large areas of forest. So we can't blame folks 500 and 400 years ago for a lot of this. A lot of this has happened in our lifetime. We have three of those projects underway at Guadalquesaba uh, with a total of a about 50,000 acres of forest, either forest that's in good shape that we're preserving with these projects, or pasture land that has to be restored to forest and that we are reforesting. The Atlantic Forest in Brazil is considered one of the five hotspots of biodiversity in the planet. And we knew also that we only had 7% left of forest. So we had the urgent need to protect the forest and there's a, a huge opportunity to do reforestation. Trees here grow very fast, here in the Atlantic Forest. After five years, when you walk through those trees, you're talking about like a five, six meters tall tree. So you already feel that some of them, after five years, you already feel that you have like a, a forest. 
This is one of our areas. People have just planted. You see, um, the seedlings, they are very fragile. So they need to be planted in a rainy day. Uh, otherwise, most of them won't survive because the, the, the sun is quite hot here. So today we might have to water them later on. Okay. And uh, just to make sure they're gonna survive in here. And, uh, and then afterwards they need to do the maintenance and just clean the grass because it's African grass, are very aggressive for them. And then just suffocate the, the seedling. So this area we just planted is next to an area of uh, three years old. So in the future we expect to have um, the same grown up forest as you can see there. So as you can see, we are in a three years old area. Uh, this area has gone through the same process as the other area we've just seen. So uh, you see some grown up trees and uh, half of it has um, gone through a, like a natural regeneration. So uh, we don't need to do any maintenance anymore because the, the invasive grass is quite controlled now. So that's an area that um, it's growing naturally. So we are helping to get the forest back and we don't need to care about it um, as before, which is a very good thing for us. Because here we are kind of learning how to grow trees, how to develop technology to do like any large scale reforestation in the Tanki Forest. We have a lot of knowledge that we can take from here and take to any other place. So now at least we know that we can plant a lot of trees. So. Uh, this is good because we need to plant billions of trees in the Atlantic Forest. The phenomenal growth rates in the tropical rainforest result in exceptional opportunities for sequestering carbon. But even in the cooler climate of North America, reforestation is an effective method to help reduce atmospheric carbon levels. In the lower Mississippi River Basin, reforestation helps offset CO2 emissions from human activities while benefiting water quality and wildlife habitat. Coal-fired power plants generate a lot of CO2 emissions. The Entergy is interested in trying to compensate for its CO2 emissions from its coal-fired power plants. They're looking at new technologies that can result in lower emissions in the long term, but in the short term, one of the options that they can take to have an immediate effect on their emissions is to plant trees to remove carbon from the atmosphere to compensate for the emissions produced from their coal. And so they decided that one cost-effective way of doing that was to change the carbon stocks on the land here in Independence County. This land used to be cropland, so it had a relatively low uh, amount of carbon per hectare. And what they've done is they've planted mixed hardwood species in order to increase the carbon stocks. And that carbon, of course, is coming out of the atmosphere. The way the agreement actually works is they make a per acre payment to the landowner and they pay for the costs of planting the trees. And then the landowner signs over an agreement that says he will keep the land in these trees for 90 years. When people develop projects for sequestering carbon, they always talk about the other benefits that you get besides the carbon. So in a situation like this, you get habitat for ducks, but you also get some better uh, water management, flood control, reduced runoff, reduced nutrient loading in the Mississippi. So there's lots of other benefits that people talk about as being associated with these projects. Ducks Unlimited is producing similar environmental and economic benefits by restoring forests in the bottomlands of the lower Mississippi River. The bottomland hardwoods of the lower Mississippi Valley consisted of about 24 million acres historically. That's been reduced to about 6 million acres, uh, primarily through conversion to agriculture. The financial situation in agriculture today, many of these acres are really marginal on whether or not you can make a profit and sustain agricultural economy on those lands. And so those are the ones that lend themselves to restoration at the present time. When we restore a site, we use 10 to 15 different species of plants and we key those plants to the type soil and the type hydrology so they match where they would historically have grown in, in the bottomland hardwood forest. But you have to look at management of the stand. You have to look at the ability to be able to thin that stand and allow for the trees to develop crowns. The more crown they have, the more leaves they expose to sunlight, the more carbon dioxide they remove from the atmosphere and store in the wood products that they produce. 
Reforestation not only provides uh, additional wildlife habitat, it improves the quality of the air, water quality, it improves groundwater recharge. It also sequesters a tremendous amount of carbon from the atmosphere. And one thing that most people don't see is that it provides uh, additional financial benefits to the landowner in terms of not only recreational leases or hunting club memberships, but uh, the, the ultimate potential of uh, a timber harvest that would store carbon in products such as flooring, furniture, or wood used to construct houses that would keep this carbon locked up for a long period of time. Using the wood products from a forest keeps carbon in storage. When a tree dies or burns, carbon is released to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Good forest management can reduce the severity of forest fires and the amount of carbon dioxide those fires emit to the atmosphere. Fire reduction strategies are being put into practice in the Redding area of Northern California, where forest fires have released large amounts of CO2 in recent years. Fire is not entirely a natural phenomenon. We have, to some extent, created this problem by decades of fire suppression, eliminating fire from the ecosystems, allowing a lot of fuel to build up. So is there something, is there some human action that can be used to affect those emissions, and should you get credit for it? We're, we're doing really three different types of projects. Reforestation, uh, fuel reduction to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from wildfire, and forest management projects. So each of those has a different kind of carbon equation associated with it. Probably the most complex and interesting one that we've seen is this idea of fuel reduction. Fuel reduction, removing the underbrush, reduces the potential for severe forest fires and also reduces the amount of CO2 emissions from those fires. Combining reforestation and fuel reduction strategies can transform brush fields into new stands of trees that will absorb and store carbon for hundreds of years in a sustainable forest. We're loggers and have been forever, but we're also environmentalists, and the two are not contradictory to one another. We have 920 acres all together, and we're trying to do a good job of sustainable forestry. You have a hot southern face here that was pretty much logged off, and there's about 25 acres or so in here that are substantially brush fields, and they pose just a huge threat from a, a fire danger, and that they are the first ladder fuel that's going to explode go up into the crowns of the trees and perhaps spread over all 920 of our acres as well as the adjoining lands. And so by doing this project in which we're going to be removing all of the brush, we're going to eliminate the possibility of a catastrophic fire. Uh, we're going to be placing in its place approximately 6,000 pine trees that will later on grow into a, a fine forest that will trap carbon. Other forest management techniques focus on thinning to grow large, healthy trees and reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. These young trees are part of the ladder fuels that move fire from the ground to the crowns of taller trees. In order to grow large trees, we need to thin out the smaller trees Trees are competing for the same moisture and light, and when they're overcrowded, they will stagnate and not grow well. Uh, the second reason is to protect the stand from wildfire. That's one of the greatest risks in northeastern California. Basically, the design here is to remove what we call ladder fuels, which, when a fire occurs, will climb up into the crown, and you'll have a large crown fire with flame lengths of a hundred feet or more coming out from the very tops of these crowns. By thinning, we remove the, most of those ladder fuels so a fire coming in here will go down to the surface and the flame lengths will be four to eight to 10 feet from the surface and it makes it much easier for the firefighting agencies to put the fires out and for the trees to survive the fire. As these trees grow, they will sequester a lot of carbon, both above ground in the boles of the trees, the limbs, but also the roots. In 50 years, we'll have a lot more carbon stored on those sites that were planted than we would if we just left it alone and it grew brush. 
In this uh, region of, of California, there are markets to be able to thin the smaller material, which is not uh, big enough to sell as saw logs or veneer logs. We can get rid of the material and have it uh, processed into chips and burnt in uh, power plants to generate electricity. Burning waste wood and other biomass to make electricity recycles carbon recently absorbed from the atmosphere. Using biomass has a lower impact on the size of our carbon footprint than using fossil fuels, which release carbon that has been stored underground for millions of years. We're at a 50 megawatt biomass power plant, a wood burning power plant, and a 50 megawatt power plant is enough to power 45 to 50,000 homes. When we burn a ton of biomass fuel here, we eliminate other generated electricity that came from either coal or natural gas. These power plants have given landowners a way to thin the lower value trees. Before the power plants, it was all cost. And it was rare when you did pre-commercial thinning. What we do for the timber industry, they can thin their lands. And if it happens on a large enough scale, both on private and public lands, over time, the landscape should become more adaptable to fires. We aren't going to eliminate the fires, but we might be able to eliminate the severity of fires. Forests aren't the only focus of sequestration. North America's native prairies were rich in stored carbon until the coming of the plow. As the area became the breadbasket of the world, much of the original carbon in the soil was released to the atmosphere. America's native prairie are really a phenomenal resource. It's actually one of the most imperiled ecosystems in the world. The reason they're imperiled is that they make good cropland. Once you lose this native prairie, you can never get it back. What happens in prairie grasses is a lot of the carbon that's, that's produced by the plant is stored underground in the root systems. And that carbon will remain there and, and build up in mass as that prairie grows and is left undisturbed. And really the only way that it'll be released is if that land is tilled and exposed to the atmosphere. Ducks Unlimited's carbon credit program is an approach called terrestrial sequestration. So in essence, what Ducks Unlimited's program is doing is compensating the landowner for not releasing that organic carbon, for basically keeping it in the ground and then continuing to use the grassland as pasture or hayland. These are perpetual easements we're talking about. The landowners who want to participate in the program are compensated in two ways. One is there's a one-time upfront payment for the easement, for the grassland easement, that will be held by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. At the same time, there's an additional payment for the carbon sequestration, and that results in a conveyance of the carbon rights to Ducks Unlimited, and then we aggregate them, bundle them up, and then transfer them to a third party that will sell it then on the carbon market. We're not looking for huge increases in grasslands. We just like to see what's there kept intact. In addition to grasslands, the wetlands that dot the prairie are also important for terrestrial CO2 sequestration. Wetlands are extremely fast to sequester carbon because they're wet, they have very little oxygen, they're ideal circumstances to accumulate carbon. So when we restore a wetland or we restore grassland, the process is put back in place to put that carbon back in the soil. In the prairie pothole region of North America, it's been called the breadbasket of North America because of its agricultural production. It's also been called the duck factory of North America because of the production of wildlife and, and water birds. There are many different types of wetlands uh, f ranging from the large peatlands that we have in uh, the northern parts of Canada and uh, Russia to these kinds of uh, large deep water wetlands that you see around us here to the much smaller prairie potholes where you have water for only a few weeks out of the year. They're all very important to the ecosystem in terms of their water storage capacity at various times of the year. They're also very important for various bird life that needs different sizes and types of wetlands at different stages in their nesting and young rearing process. So we need to keep all of the sizes. We can't just keep the big ones. 
The way that we can uh, increase our carbon sinks is to try to change some of our management practices so that we're increasing the area of photosynthesis that's happening. So things like restoring wetlands and restoring the riparian buffer zone and the grasslands around those wetlands, it puts vegetation back on the landscape that can carry out that photosynthesis process and store that carbon in the soil and in the roots of the plants. The carbon in the soils, once it's stored there, it can be stored there for decades, up to centuries. It's actually more significant to modify the agricultural practices that are impacting the wetlands. We have to stop draining wetlands. We have to stop plowing right up to the edge of them because those riparian areas have important functions both in terms of carbon storage and in terms of nutrient filtering and in terms of water quality protection as well as habitat value. So the whole range is important. And the one thing that we need to convince people about is that a wetland is still a wetland even when it's dry. I think the goal is to find sustainable ways to harvest our resources and to produce food um, that allows these ecosystems to still exist in a healthy state. Tilling the soil releases carbon into the air, increasing CO2 levels. But new techniques are allowing farmers to build up carbon in their fields and still grow crops. Conventional agriculture, using conventional tillage type of equipment, introduces oxygen into the soil in much higher quantities than would occur naturally. That oxygen provides for the respiratory needs of organisms, microorganisms, that break that carbon down and release it as CO2, just like an automobile might release it. As we move forward, we're starting to see the implementation of conservation agricultural practices, no-till, zero-till, minimum-till, and those kinds of things. And what they do in effect is they reduce that disturbance, they reduce the oxidation, and they reduce the release of carbon. I would put no-till agriculture in there as probably the, the most effective way to store carbon in agricultural soils while simultaneously producing a crop. No-till farming from its conception has ba basically been a concept where you, you seed and uh, raise crops with a minimal amount of soil disturbance. Generally preparation for planting uh, begins at harvest time. The first thing that a no-till farmer needs to do is get good residue management done. And that residue management will, will vary depending on what your seeding equipment is, what your crop rotations are. But generally, you just need a very even distribution of straw and chaff behind the combine. The planting operation for most no-till farmers is a one-pass operation. Once the crop is planted is really no different than any other farming operation. If you have weeds or diseases, you apply a pesticide accordingly. Harvest operation is done the same as a conventional operation, other than keeping the residue management in mind. Some of the other side benefits would be lower energy use in a no-till farming operation. I know in my own farming operation, when all you do is seed and harvest, and you don't have those other heavy energy consuming tillage practices, cut your fuel consumption probably in half. Soil conservation has been absolutely, hands down, uh, much better in a, in a no-till environment. When you leave residue roots intact on the soil surface, your soil structure and everything will resist water erosion and wind erosion. It reduces it by tenfold of what a conventional farmer sees. The environmental benefits of a no-till farming system along with the soil conservation aspects of it is water quality. The uh, primary difference is you'll carry a lot more sediment load out of that field in a conventional operation. That obviously has an effect on our streams and lakes and municipal water supplies that use out of those. Everybody would like to see one silver bullet solve all of our sequestration uh, problems. Uh, in terms of management of atmospheric gases. That is not going to happen. 
Uh, it's going to take a great variety of things. It's going to take biological sequestration in wetlands. It's going to take grasslands. It's going to take geologic sequestration, lots of other forms, deep injections, those types of things to solve this uh, issue. This kind of sequestration is intended to be a stopgap solution uh, over the short term in terms of climate change uh, as, a, as a method to allow industry time to develop technologies for reducing direct emissions to the atmosphere. Whether it's reforestation in Brazil or the Mississippi bottomlands, fuel reduction in California, or landscape restoration and sustainable agriculture on the prairies, terrestrial CO2 sequestration is taking carbon out of the atmosphere in many parts of the world and giving us a start on dealing with the threat of climate change. Funding provided by the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Energy Technology Laboratory.